timber as spars for ships was the first of British Columbia's exports and still remains our number one resource. The western red cedar was used by the Indians for their tremendous totem poles and their great long houses that were large enough to shelter several families. Adopting the tools and materials that lay at hand, these old timers copied the longhouse for a combination cookhouse and bunkhouse. Early forest rangers also adopted native forms of transport, and here they make a dugout for use on river patrols. Somehow it seems as though we're looking at a different age, but the Forest Service used dog teams as recently as 1925 when these pictures were taken in northern BC. Possibly it's a bit unfair to relegate the horse to the level of an historical curiosity since there are many rugged sections of the province where he's invaluable for packing supplies to men on remote fire lines. Where roads were good, some forest guards enjoyed the luxury of a smartly turned out horse and buggy. Yep, in them days things was different all right. Trees was bigger and nobody would ever bother with some of the toothpicks you see logs these days. I think the men was bigger too, bigger and tougher. Well, stands to reason. It had to be if they was gonna log that big stuff. Hauling such timber needed power. In the early days, that meant animal power. And there was no more powerful draft animal than the ox. In some areas, where the trees were smaller than those of the coast, a horse was used for skidding logs. One can still find small operations where the horse is the most practical means of hauling. Even when steam power was first used, the logger's mind was still on animals, and he called his machine a donkey. Steam was gradually replaced by the internal combustion engine, and the tractor which used the endless track developed for battle tanks in World War I was a big advance, as was the logging arts that lifted the front end of a turn of logs free of forest debris. The tractor has the added advantage of being wonderfully suited to making its own roads through the bush, with the coming of road building equipment, it was not long before the logging truck appeared. The first ones with no protective cab, and usually giving a bone-jolting ride on hard springs and solid rubber tires. Timber was cheaper then, and plank roads improved the ride and the speed of hauling. Now the trucks seem to get bigger every day, so that many of them are too large for the use on public highways, and spend their days confined to private logging roads. So as the industry has grown, we find that every man's job is specialized. The truck driver is just that, and in many cases does not even own a pair of cocked boots to mark him as a logger. There is no doubt that the old breed is dying out and being replaced by highly skilled teams where each man's job dovetails tightly into a vast and complex organization. Well, like I was saying, in those days, men was men. There's nothing fancy in the woods. Why, you know, I've been here nowadays, they has real beds with mattresses and, and even sheets. It is true that some of the old skills are not so important in the woods today. Many an old-timer developed phenomenal dexterity with a double-bitted axe, often to the point where it became a living extension of his hands. This was his prime tool, and in the hands of an expert, the axe could do the work of an adze or even a plane. Equally important, the cross-cut saw, which had seen no change in its basic design for thousands of years, was always kept in top condition. A man's wages depended on how much timber he felled and bucked each day. But even after the coming of modern machinery, there were still a few rugged individualists who used these two basic tools to bring logs to tidewater in the hope of building a little grub stake for themselves. They were the hand loggers. A few years ago, there were still some of them around, but it's doubtful if they operate today. They selected trees glowing close to the shore, usually on a steep hillside, and often it must be said they weren't too concerned about who exactly owned the timber. If they chose wisely, they could fall their tree directly into the water. But if it landed a few yards up the hill, they could still get it afloat by the use of peavies and jacks. 
Sometimes the hand loggers worked in pairs, but often the man would be on his own. The idea of one man having the audacity to even imagine that he could handle huge sticks single-handed is astonishing to the city dweller. But with his saw, his axe, the indispensable Gilchrist Jack, and plenty of time to do the job, these solitary men contributed their bit to our lumber industry. Apart from the money they hoped to earn, they took to this lonely existence because of a love of solitude and the challenge they faced every working day. Of course, even in those days there were camps so big that no one need worry about lack of company. In our continual struggle to use our heads to save our muscle, it wasn't long before the gasoline engine was hooked onto the saw. First came a piston-like arrangement used for bucking, and uh, this dangerous type of buzz saw was used in the 30s for bucking firewood. The chainsaw, combining the motor with an endless chain of cutting teeth, was the first really portable mechanical saw. As it was improved in weight, cutting ability, and reliability, the logger found less and less need for the axe that had for so long been his basic tool. Oh, things sure change. You take high rigging, for instance. Uh, used to be topping a spar tree and rigging the lines was a real art, but nowadays uh, just about the only place you can see these guys is in some logger's sports. That's not quite true. In some places, the natural spar tree is still used, usually in combination with gasoline or diesel donkey. But more and more, particularly on the bigger shows, the portable steel spar is taking over. It's quicker, safer, and can be erected almost anywhere where there are a few square feet of level ground. Our coastal waterways are still one of the cheapest and best routes for transporting logs to the mill and the familiar log boom is still very much with us. But a flat boom is useless in open water, and the Davis raft was devised. Its building was time-consuming and difficult, with thick cables tying the whole mass into one huge bundle of timber that must later be broken down at the mill. It was an improvement to use the hulls of old ships as barges, but even here, each log had to be loaded and unloaded separately. Further thinking on the subject resulted in the development of the self-dumping barge. The latest of these even have their own cranes for loading, and dumping is accomplished by flooding compartments in one side of the hull until the vessel has enough list to allow the logs to slide into the water. Of course, just about everybody knows about tugs and booms and all that, but up in the interior, they used to use the rivers quite a bit, too. See, in them days, we didn't have no roads in lots of places, and the only way of getting around was by the rivers. Up in that country, uh, most of the Forest Service guys, rangers and so on, uh, they used canoes, and it wasn't all that easy when you had to make a portage. Then, of course, the outboard motor replaced the paddle. And once more, life was made just a bit easier for the men of the Forest Service. Not only that, but with engines, it meant that the river boats could negotiate rapids that would have been unthinkable when motive power was supplied by the paddle. The latest development in this area is the jet boat, a shallow draft type of craft that has no propeller but is driven by a powerful pump that forces a jet of water astern. Not yet widely used, it can be invaluable in shallow waters where a propeller-driven craft with its greater draft could not operate at all. One of the things them old-timers was real good at was inventing things. 
you know little tricks and ideas to make things go just a mite easier. Like, like this here turnaround. Now, maybe some guy got the idea from a locomotive roundhouse or maybe a merry-go-round. No matter, don't matter. No. Thing is, it worked and saved space and time. Or oh, how about dumping your truck by tilting the whole shebang? Kind of neat, eh? Yeah, lots of things like that. The old timers figured that out. Most of them have forgot these days. Some smart fella figured here the best way of lifting his trailer back on the truck was slip the truck under the trailer. Ah, uh, thinking all the time in those days. Yes, they were thinking all the time. Thinking of ways to save labor. In the winter, why bother with a sled? And the logs would go faster on their own. As we've said, water is one of the best ways to transport logs. And if the creek or river is not suitable, what better way than to make your own wooden canal to get the timber to the mills? This motorless truck on its wooden tracks looks like some primitive ride on an amusement park. But it did the job cheaply and efficiently, even if a bit dangerously. Ingenuity is still with us. Advances continue to be made. But nowadays, the complexity of the logging industry means that the foresters in charge are usually university graduates, as much at home in an office with a slide rule as out in the bush. Their knowledge covers many fields, including biology, surveying, engineering, and management. Working on a program of continuous yield, they plan crops that they will not live to harvest since the seedlings planted today will not become lumber for 70 or 80 years. And although mechanization increases and the machines become larger and more complex and fewer and fewer men are needed to extract our timber crop, it's extremely unlikely that the day will ever come when the forest industry is fully automated. Behind the machines, there will always be a skilled operator. And behind the operator will be the men with the inventive minds always seeking some better, faster, safer, and cheaper way of harvesting the forest wealth of British Columbia.